It's just a new year. Well, good morning again. Everybody okay today? Amen. Happy New Year! Again. As Kathy said, I don't look any older than I did last year. So I'm very, very thankful. Whew. Go to Psalm 62. We're going to go there in a little bit. Um, so thankful. When you end out a, a year, it's a good thing to do. I mention it often to kind of, hey, let's look back at last year. What was last year like? Were you able to accomplish some of the things that you desire to do? What did the Lord do in you? And, and then you start making a, a little bit of a list of, of things that, okay, God, uh, what is 2021 going to be? And uh, I heard that uh, this year has been a little bit different. Is that true? I've been living in a cave for a few months, and I didn't, uh, I heard there was some things that happened a little bit different. There was Gosh, a president election again and all that stuff. So I guess there's a lot of normal things in life going on, but uh, you know that those are just things of your daily natural life. What about your spiritual life? What about your life in the Lord and what it's like? Well, uh, we're going to uh, take an approach the next two Sundays, this Sunday and next Sunday. Next Sunday I'm going to pass out a handout that we pass out every year and, and talk a little bit about... Uh, what 2021 for First Bible Baptist Church will look like in a collective way, in a corporate way with our community. I've already been laying out for you a lot of uh, what um, God would have us to do and what God's leading us to do in the Acts 2 project and refine the mission of, of our church and First Bible Baptist Church. And a lot of these uh, statements, a lot of these things have been spoken to you uh, with a with more of a general idea of, okay, this is generally, or again, uh, community-wide, church-wide, uh, how it applies to all of us together. Well, today we're going to look at things, today and, and next Sunday, things individually. And part of your New Year's time of looking at last year and looking at this year is, uh, what is it that you're expecting? What are your expectations and uh, what do we think about in expectations? And so I want to speak to you a couple of years back. Oh, it's got to be uh, over two years or whatever. One of our messages came into, uh, um, we were in the book of Acts, and we looked at what those were expecting. And, and uh, the, the verse that was in, I believe it's in Acts chapter number three, where the word expecting shows up. And, it, and it's in reference to, the people around the apostles and, and what they're expecting from them. And, and really that was more of a personal type of expectation and how people expect things. But today I want you to, to really think about what your expectations are and what you expect from the Lord. Maybe that's where you and I need to start is what is our expectation of the Lord and, and how we uh, expect him to work in our lives and, and what it ought to be. And it is going to be tied together with our Acts 2 project that we introduced a, a few weeks ago. And uh, I think of, again, these two verses in verse number 46 and 47 often. I just want to, I got them up on the screen. You don't have to turn there. You can stay right where you are in Psalm 62. But here's the account from Apostle Luke about the early church. And referencing they, being the early believers, this first Christian church, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. And of course, remember, we work back at verse number 42 where we knew that they continued steadfastly. This continuing with one accord is very, very important that they uh, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. There was a camaraderie. There was a oneness. They were praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. That's where we've been spending time the last few weeks just kind of looking at what would it be like for the Acts 1-8 vision to go a little bit further and that we would then say, okay, we have been on mission, and, and, and how, how does that look, Pastor? Well, we look at refine, to refine the mission and say, okay, God, if, if you're going to do something and refine something, you would clarify it. You would uh, 
clean it up a little bit. You'd purify it. So we think of the Acts 2 mission, Acts, excuse me, Acts 2 project, and we think about how it would be that God you need to really get us going a little bit further. You need us to be a little bit more in and a little bit more of a, at a place where we go, okay, God, I, I have great expectations from you. I, I expect you to do things, but beyond just having these great expectations in the flesh or great works that we might do, I really would like to have us focus this morning on a guy named David. Again, we, we taught on David as the king uh, the first half of this year, and I just want to go back and, and just uh, tap into King David one more time uh, in Psalm 62, because I, I see him in a place where, again, many times as a church, we lose that track of what we ought to do because of some of the things that get in the way. That being the case, when we looked at Paul's example last week of this church at Thessalonica, we see where this church at Thessalonica had it really good from the very beginning. They, they got it right from the very, very beginning. But not every church is like that. And so when we thought, okay, this Acts 2 project, boy, that, that sounds beautiful, Pastor, but, but what if things go goofy and go wrong? Well, we put out before you last week what would happen if things went right. What if things were exactly the way God would have them to be out of 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1? And we thought, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, your patience of hope of our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of the, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. And we, we came up with this uh, really simple but very powerful uh, deep in a lot of ways when you really concentrate on it, and that's what we're going to spend time on, looking at this from David's perspective, but seeing it from the, from the New, uh, New Testament church and seeing how we live faith and that we love others and that we declare hope, we took it right out of a model church. That church at Thessalonica, we understand them to be really a church that we would love to follow. And again, Acts 2, boy, Everything was just clicking on all cylinders. Then we look at the church of Thessalonica, everything, oh gosh, that's just beautiful. The Acts 2 project, everything makes sense because they took it on. And, and, and of course, Paul wrote to that church and uh, exhorted them and, and also too just kind of encouraged them and lifted them up. But today we're going to spend a little time beyond how good it would be and how everything, if it just went right, and how you and I have to see how when we are challenged in our personal life about living faith, of loving others, of declaring that hope. Hey, some days it just doesn't go as well as we expected. When it comes to your expectation and what you see God able to do in your life, I want you to take, again, this very, very personal today. We looked again at the church and the Acts 2 project collectively. We looked at the church in 1 Thessalonians and saw how that church is really doing it well and they are a great model church and how Paul wrote that letter to comfort them as they had lost some believers that went on to heaven, but he also reminded them of their dedication to the fundamentals of the faith, how discipleship was so important and they had disciples and, and people that really followed the Lord strongly. But today, what if your expectations were not met? What if you thought, okay, God expected us to do a certain thing. God expects us to, to, to just have everything going the way it ought to be. And then when it doesn't, do you change your expectations? Do you lower things down? Or you say, well, my expectations were too high. Or, or uh, you know what, uh, um, maybe they weren't high enough. Or, or maybe it just is such a difficult situation that, there's no way we could fulfill those expectations. It's an interesting thing about that. You see, today, I could say, well, these are my expectations for you. Or could I, I could say, well, these are God's expectations for you. And those are both fine, and I want you to think that way a little bit. But I want you to, to really look at Psalm 62 with me. We're going to read it now. And I want you to see where David... Who is in a place, I believe, and there's you know, different thoughts of when this psalm was written. To me, it lines up beautifully with 
2 Samuel 14, 15, 16, around there, when, when uh, David was being challenged for the kingdom by Absalom, and uh, Absalom then takes the kingdom from him, and David runs, and he's off in exile, and he's alone, and he, he is being tested in so many ways, and he is saying, oh, Lord, I need you. Oh, Lord, please, God, I need you to be there for me. So follow me. Go along with Psalm 62. Let's read it and get the text of, hey, there was this, once again, this great expectation, and then things went a little awry for David's life. What do you do to get back to fulfilling the expectations of your life from the Lord? Verse 1 says, truly my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Verse 3, how long will ye imagine mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain, all of you, as a bowing wall shall ye be, and as a tottering fence they only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly, Selah. Think of it. David is pouring out his heart. He's saying his soul waits, up from, waits upon God. He recognizes that everything is really personal in his life with the Lord and how it's my salvation. He is my rock. He is my everything. Look at verse number four. Excuse me, verse number five. But my soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from God. Think of where your expectation comes from. To expect all the things that you expect, it comes from God. Not expectation in, not expectation for. The scripture is saying, my soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. For he only, excuse me, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved in God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Think about verse number eight. It uses the pronoun us. But what have we seen in those few verses just before that? My, 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 my soul, my salvation. It is a personal possessive pronoun as David is saying how personal his relationship is with God, of his, the God of his salvation. Verse 9 through 12, we continue. Surely men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Trust not in oppression, and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his work. Now, Lord, we've opened up your scripture. We've had a little bit of time reviewing some things, but now, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the next few minutes that you will really just work in our hearts that we would see our expectation, my expectation would become very personal because it's from you, Lord. Use this message to challenge us by your spirit. Teach us, each one of us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Now let's highlight this verse number five. My soul, wait thou only upon God for my expectation is from him. I expect a lot of things. One of the places in which we all can get a little bit discombobulated is if we 
And our minds think, oh, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and then it doesn't happen. We get upset. We get bothered. There are many that have said that in the past that if there was a way of measuring all of our frustration, it would be the, the distance between expectation and reality and how we get a little bit frustrated. But here, from the Bible, it says that my expectation is from him. Sometimes you and I get all tied up with our expectations of other people. They don't come from the Lord. We get tied up with expectations of ourselves that are not from the Lord. We expect us to be sinless in our actions when the one that's made us sinless is the Lord Jesus Christ and his standard is holiness. So why would it not be that we would be holy as he is holy? That's his expectation for you and for me. No, I need to eliminate this and get rid of this and I get rid of that and I need to do this and I spend my whole rest of my life just beating myself up until I be holy for I am holy. How does that happen? Well, you have to realize what the scriptures say about sanctification and you need to be taught that and have it modeled out for a more mature believer in your life. You need to have someone walk you through that and teach you through it. That's why we have children having children's ministry and being taught the Bible through adults that are more mature. Well, I don't know. Hopefully they're more mature. And we want them to walk them through. But when we get to be adults, we're experts. Somehow, some way, you're all experts at what God wants from you. And unfortunately, our expectations get all tied up between what we may see or what someone else may see that is an expectation that's contrary to the Bible. If there's an expectation that lines up with the Bible, then that's right on the money. That's part of what discipleship does. That's what a good disciple-making relationship does, is points people back to what the Scriptures say about the possessiveness of your salvation, the possessiveness of Jesus Christ being your rock, the possession of what we have in the mind. My appears 14 times in this psalm. Count them. Check it out. My rock, my salvation, my defense, my rock of strength, my expectation, my glory. You say that's being a little bit selfish when it comes to that statement. No, he's saying, look, you, God, are my glory. He's clearly making sure that we understand that all of these expectations are God speaking through David and speaking in David to say, look, this whole idea that you have about, or I have, about how we are expected to do certain things, God's saying, look, my soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. My expectation is from him. Now, think for a moment. Do you look to God for your expectation of your life? Because then you might have expectations that line up with the Lord. As the pastor of First Bible Baptist Church, I have a great deal of expectations for all of us together, collectively, corporately. I shared a little bit of that last week. I'm going to share a little bit more with you today and a little more next week. You say, just give us the nuts and bolts and let us go do the stuff. Unfortunately, that's how we're wired so deeply and so, to me, incorrectly. This stuff is important, yes, but the stuff that's going on inside of here is even more important to the Lord. We do know about this David guy. We do know about how his life got all conflicted, messed up, and then sin got a hold of him. And we understand when he's writing a psalm like this, it's because he has to run to a place of exile and be alone and be reminded of how things in his life that God had for him, he had lost track of them. And he comes back and he says, my expectation is from the Lord. It's from God. Where do you get your daily expectation? Well, I want you to see three simple things that I see in our expectation, in your expectation for us. The first one is, up on the screen, you can see that, and it has to do with faith. It ties together very simply with, where is my faith at, and how do I see complete faith? Within your expectation of God comes complete faith 
in my rock and in my salvation. See, you and I don't really kind of grab a handle on this sometimes until we're desperately in trouble. Are you saved this morning? Are you born again? Sure, I am, Pastor. I remember when I gave my life to Christ, I remember calling on the name of the Lord to save me. I believed in my heart. I confessed with my mouth. I turned from the ways of my sin, and, and I asked for forgiveness. As the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God's. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, okay, so it's faith. You end up simply saying, okay, by faith I'm going to completely trust in the Lord. Well, that's what David's saying here. We say, boy, we looked at this Acts 2 project a couple weeks ago, and that Acts 2 church, they had it going on. Boy, that, that's such a model perfect place. And, and so, gosh, I don't know if we could ever do that. And then we look at the church of Thessalonica last week, and we go, live faith, love others. I mean, I, that sounds really, really great. But what about us? And the reality of life is that not all of us go after the expectation of our lives from the Lord. To say this is my expectation I have in my life, and it came from the Lord. You need to expect something from the Lord, but you need to line up with what the Lord says. And he is saying, my rock and my salvation. The Bible is teaching you and me, coming from the heart of David, look, I expect you to do things, God. I have great expectation for you. As the word says, it's to await, to anticipate. When you look up the word expectation, you find it to be, uh, in the Strong's Concordance, it says, a cord, a cord attached, a cord attached to someone or something that you long for. Expectation's a cord. It literally is a cord that ties something together with something that you need. Well, within your expectation of God, the cord that ties you to God comes complete faith. How is it that the church, how is it that the individual believers are so weak in their faith still? Because maybe we haven't decided that we really want to be a saint. Say, I thought you were going to use the word disciple. Well, it's interesting that the word disciple disappears after the book of Acts, that you are a saint that you are set apart for his work, that you are sanctified, that you are to be made holy. Yes, so then we call it discipleship. Maybe we should start calling it saintship. What do you think? We'll be saints. Because you see, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You say, I know that. Then how is it that you waver so easily? Because my expectation ought to be from the Lord, which then solidifies that it's my rock and my salvation and not yours in the way that you see it. Because my salvation lines up with the one who gave me the salvation, then it becomes my salvation. He then becomes my rock. What if this is a rock right here? There's a tornado coming. This rock weighs about 2,000 pounds. I'm grabbing a hold of that rock. Get me a chain, wrap it around my ankle. I'm not going to be moved from this spot when the tornado comes because he is my rock and my salvation. You know the passages of Scripture. You know the verses. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? But yet, we waver as badly as anyone else, and we ought not to. I'm not saying everyone, I'm not saying every believer, I'm not saying every disciple, I'm not saying every follower, I'm not saying every saint, but listen, church, your expectation, my only, my alone, my enough, is him, and him alone. It says in verse number one, truly my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. Truly, which is nevertheless, indeed, my daughter loves that word, indeed, when she agrees with something, or she says, hey, you got my attention? Indeed, I like that, indeed. But my soul waiteth upon the Lord, which means my soul used to wait on something else. He only, in verse number two, is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Don't just read this as a trite little devotion on, in some morning and say, I'm going to be fine, and forget the truth of the promises of what this does for your faith. It completes you in your mind. Completion, perfection, sanctification comes in your life when you actually give the Lord a chance to do that. 
expectation from God. Within that comes complete faith. You say, I'd love to have a bigger faith. I need God to grow my faith. I need to have a stronger faith. Amen. Thank you. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Well, you're just re rehearsing Bible verses for me. It really doesn't matter much. Why don't you and I together covenant with God to say in 2021 that I love to see my expectations be his expectations that he puts in me from verse number five. May I read it again? My soul, wait thou only upon God. My soul, wait thou about everybody else. No, wait only upon God for my expectation is from him. We want to wait on everybody else. What does the word wait mean? To serve, to get up under, to meet the need of. No, I like to wait and sit around in the house and I'm hoping that God will show up. It doesn't work that way. When David learned of how things got discombobulated in his life, he lost his idea of what expectations of his life were ought to be. He sits down, he pens a psalm, and he goes, Whoo, in my prayer life, I finally get things back where I'm reminded that you are my rock and my salvation. You are the one that I have a, the, my complete faith in. And when I have my complete faith in you, it's unmovable. Let me tell you, there's a crazy man that hangs out around here. He's been here for eight plus years. And I've never said this to him. So maybe you can stop the video. Just kidding. Bobby say oftentimes, it's in Jesus. It's only Jesus. That's all you need is Jesus. And I went, oh, will you please just stop. It is only Jesus. It is only his word. It is only his salvation. My expectation is from the Lord. It's not my expectation, expectations need to meet the Lord at a certain place. They come from the Lord, and once I get them from the Lord, then I have them for my life. Yeah. And that's only Jesus. And it is the right way to go, because I promise you this. When Brother Alex and Chris will get on the plane here in a few days, and they fly off a few thousand miles away with your two beautiful girls, just like when you flew here, it's still Jesus and only the Lord. And it's the expectations from the Lord that are you are going to have to be fulfilled in. It'll be the expectations. Well, what are the people going to want? And what are the people going to want? And what are the people going to want? And what are the people going to want? You can handle that once you and I know that our expectations personally and our own personal walk come from the Lord. We are to live faith in God as my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. My salvation, my glory, my rock of, my, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. You live faith that way. Unfortunately, we throw out trite little hashtags without the truth of the word of God, without the power of the word of God, without the promise of the word of God. The power doesn't come from me yelling and screaming. I just get a little excited sometimes because I'm nuts. But I'm just telling you, it comes from the truth of the word of God. That you live faith and that you believe in faith because it is through Jesus Christ that you go into the Lord's house, you walk into the Lord's presence and you say, Lord, give me the expectations from you. That's all I want. I want you to give me the expectations for my life, whatever they may be. And they don't line up with your flesh. They line up with the spirit of God in you. Within your expectation, number two, of God comes complete love. Oh gosh, I kinda, you're kind of figuring this out. I don't even have to look very far to find any of this. I don't even have to work very hard. Because I thought, okay God, this David guy's been bothering me. God was just lining some up for the next couple of messages of the first of the year. I'm, okay God, what do you want me to do? And of course the study of King David just really got a hold of my heart this year and all of us and we're just looking at King David, King David and all this stuff, nothing's beyond your grace. And I'm thinking, okay, what are some of the Psalms you wrote and some of the Psalms that really hit and we researched and looked at them and studied a lot of them. But here we are, looking at Psalm 62 and finding out this is another trust psalm. Psalm 63, any of you ever memorized some of that one? Another psalm of trust, trusting the Lord, trusting the Lord, trusting the Lord. 
Well, that what we looked at there was about the fact that we have complete faith. Here we are, within your expectation of God, comes complete love. How? In the fact that he is your refuge and your defense. My refuge, my defense. Why is that so important to David? Because so many enemies were against him. You think you got enemies? You think this world is after you? You think that it's rough and tough to live this life? They all wanted him dead. He was the ruler of that nation and they wanted him out. How would you like it if your family tomorrow said, we want you out, dad. We want you out, mom. David had the whole nation of Israel said, we'll take Absalom, we're out. But then some started going to David. David had some that would follow him. Later, more came to him because they saw that the Spirit of God was still upon him. But people were following Absalom. It says in your Bible in 2 Samuel that there was many people came and gave a report to David that people were following him, that Absalom went and grabbed chariots and horses and he was gonna overtake and he did in Jerusalem. And again, he took David's mighty counselor, Ahithophel, and Ahithophel fell and went toward Absalom. You think of him. He needs a refuge. He needs defense. There's people coming and lying to him. There's armies that want to wipe him out. There's people that just want him dead. And he knew what it meant to have a refuge. And he knew what it meant to have the Lord to be my defense. We are thankful to military personnel for defending our country, and we are thankful. But I have to tell you, I'm, I'm so very thankful for my God to be my defense. He is your defense. He is your refuge, and he takes care of you every single day when you think he's not doing it. He takes care of you when you're in pain. He takes care of you when an enemy seems to rise up against you. He takes care of you when you think that your family doesn't love you. When all the things that come from your past, all the rebuking from your people, that, all the abuse, all the evil in your life, he says, you can have your expectation in me. And you can learn how to love your enemies. And you can learn how to love those that don't love you. And you can learn how to love all the way through this because I am your refuge and I am your defense. You see, this love others thing is huge. We just pick and choose one day to love somebody just because we're having a good day. And the next day we don't love them like we ought to. Having a bad day like David, I'm not so sure any of us have ever had a day like that. David lost a lot. As the old phrase goes, as you walk with the Lord Jesus Christ over many years, you better learn how to be a good loser because you're going to lose an awful lot if you follow him. And that's all right. David says, how long will you imagine mischief against a man? Will you spend more time thinking about how bad things are here and imagine how it is that I could just get back at somebody or, 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 or get it? Wait a minute, wait a minute now. Let me, let me just kind of think like God and I'll play God right now, and, and I'm going to fix that person. God tells you to leave it alone. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Surely men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Oh, well, God doesn't understand my plight. You don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand all the pain and all the agony, all the abuses and all the hard stuff that I've had. You don't know how bad my life has been. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm still supposed to love those that have persecuted me. I'm supposed to love those that hate me. I'm supposed to love those. You just sung a song. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it into good. That's Jesus Christ. You want to see the epitome of Jesus Christ in someone's life. They will live faith they will love others, and they will not be concerned about men that are of high degree. They will not be in a place where they're going to trust oppression. Do not trust oppression, David writes in there. Do you love that in verse number 10? He says, do not love oppression. Trust not in it and become vain in robbery. Oh, I'm going to steal back stuff. People hurt me. I'll get back another pound of flesh from them, and I will trust in oppression. No, 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 no. Trust not in oppression. You say, oppression is what destroyed me and has hurt me. 
Sin does hurt. Sin does cause pain. Wicked people do evil things. We're still supposed to love others. We're still supposed to love others. We're still supposed to love others. David learned when things got sideways, when things got upside down, when things weren't right, that his faith needed to have a check for completeness and his love had to have a check for completeness. And he understood that God was his refuge and God is his strength and God is his defense and God is his salvation and God is his rock. And lastly, within your expectation of God comes complete hope. Complete hope in my expectation and my glory. That cord that's attached to someone or something, that's my expectation. My expectation is attached to the Lord Jesus Christ. That ought to be where our expectation is attached. David's messianic view of things, David pictured as Messiah Jesus, a typology of Jesus, and the last type as we have, received a covenant with the Lord through prophet Nathan in, in his life and his failures and his coming up short of expectations that he knew were of the Lord and from the Lord. He then made sure of things. He wrote things down and he realized that faith, I need to live it. Love, I need to love those that are against me and love those for, I just need to love others. And here, I realize that my expectation of God becomes and comes complete. It, it comes complete. It just comes complete hope. Complete hope in what? My expectation and my glory. What does he say about my glory? He teaches you and me about, hey, this is not anything other than me not being moved by what's going on around me. Verse number two, just for free, and uh, once again, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. I will not be moved. My expectation is from him. It says in verse number five. Verse number six, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Ha, and God is my salvation and my glory. Verse seven, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Everything is in him. And when I think about what it ought to be, it is all in him. He is the all in all. And as the years went on and the years went on, I understand what Pastor Bobby's saying. And many of you that have lived long enough in the Lord and he has matured you say, yeah, you're right. It is about living out your faith and it is about just loving others. And the source of all this is the Lord Jesus Christ and our God of glory. And then we get to a place where we say, my expectation is from the Lord. I see who you are, God. I see you at work. God has spoken twice. Listen, this is the last two verses of the psalm. God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. Do you think anyone is more powerful than God? You really think that this world has got something over on God? You think that going on the YouTube channel or go online and trying to find out a tweet or go on Parler or go on all these different platforms and trying to figure out what's going on. All those people are doing is wrestling for power that they're never going to get. Because when it comes right down to it, the Lord, it says there, has all the power. Power belongeth unto God. And if any man think he's got any power, it's because God gave it to him anyway and he took it upon himself in the vanity of lies to think that it came from him. That's where we are as a church, as a, as a collective, but more importantly, personally saying, Lord, you have all the power. You've spoken it once. Twice have I heard it. Verse number 12, also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy. So, all power belongs to him, and all mercy belongs to him. For thou renderest to every man according to his work. I'd rather live there with the expectation from the Lord, than to think that, oh God, you want me to do this, and you want me to do this, and I need to twist this around, and I need to mess with this, and I don't trust you, Lord, and I lose my trust and my faith in him. I, I wander off and I don't love others like I ought to love, and then I forget where my hope really comes from. And so when I go to tell somebody, or declare hope to somebody, it's wishy-washy. It doesn't line up with my life. Listen, people need to look to you 
And when you say, my hope is built on nothing less, they need to know that that's where you live. When you say, my hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you don't say it tritely. My hope is in God. He has all the power and all the mercy. Power to save by his grace. Mercy to forgive by his grace. Bam. Now you've just declared hope for other people. There are people that need an idea that there's hope in this world. Not hope in the world itself, but in hope in this world that they live in, that the hope is in someone that's beyond this world. And that is our holy God that David is talking about when he says again in verse number one, truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. So, Put your faith completely in him. Love other people completely as he did. And then declare hope completely as he did. That's how the Acts 2 project isn't for everyone else. It's not for the church building, though we are going to gather in the temple. It's not just for the other person that's going to go house to house. It's for you and for me. Your expectation is this. Now that you have seen what David wrote, it says, oh, this is my expectation. This is my rock. This is my refuge. This is my salvation. This is my defense. This is my glory. This is all for his glory. We glorify God through the Acts 1-8 vision, and we also refine the mission with the Acts 2 project. Live faith, love others, declare hope. Personal today, personal for you, personal for me. So the question is, what is your expectation of God in your life personally? I'm gonna read one more time. For my soul, comma, wait thou, only upon God, semicolon, for my expectation is from him. Please bow your heads for a word of prayer and a time for invitation. Now the music's going to play in the background now, and I'm just going to pray for you. And I'm going to ask you again this question. What is your expectation of God in your life personally? What is your expectation from God for 2021? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your precious and holy word. We thank you for how you have revealed yourself to us through the Acts 2 project and the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 2, through the Acts 2 project in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1, and the Acts 2 project who was going to the Old Testament and look at David's life. And I thank you for how you reveal to us how faith, hope, love, they're all so very important to you. And how we just need to get a handle on our expectation being the expectation from the Lord. I pray in this invitation time, get a hold of hearts as we deal with things in our own lives. Please God, work in everyone, I pray in Jesus' name. Please stand. And please respond as God would have you as the music plays. She's going to turn it up a little bit for you.